I think when you're going through life knowing every time you walk out of your apartment building that you might be able to be arrested for something that you did not do, it's so profoundly un-American that you could be arrested for anything at any time, that a cop could put drugs on you, could then get on the witness stand in a courthouse and say that you were guilty when you were not. You know, last fall, last November, 15 men in Chicago came to the courthouse and were exonerated altogether. There are men who all served time for crimes they say they didn't commit. Now the county's top prosecutor agrees with them. Because of crooked police investigations. It was believed to be the first mass exoneration in Cook County history. Let's talk about some of the main characters in the story, starting with Ronald Watts. Who is he and what kind of a person is he? Ronald Watts was a sergeant in the Chicago Police Department. Their job was to root out the drug trafficking and the drug dealing going on in the Ida B. Wells homes. What they were actually doing, in fact, what he was actually doing, is running his own sort of criminal enterprise, uh, shaking down drug dealers, shaking down other residents of the projects, and demanding money from them, bribes. He was planting drugs, heroin, cocaine, on residents and hauling them to the precinct and then off to jail. When I would ask some of the men who had been arrested by him how they would describe him, some of them would talk about training day, about the corrupt detective. All right. I'm putting cases on all you bitches. Huh? You think you can do this shit? I'm the police! I run shit here! You just live here! All right, the story takes place primarily in a housing project on the south side of Chicago that no longer exists, but it was called the Ida B. Wells Homes, and it was opened in 1941. It was the first housing project in Chicago that was built specifically for African Americans. It was segregated housing, and at the time was a place of tremendous promise. It really embodied the aspirations of the entire neighborhood. And then over the decades, the Chicago Housing Authority neglected their buildings, the place became incredibly run down. You have graffiti, you have gunshots, you have, you know, open air drug dealing. So it's a very, very challenging place to grow up. You know, I think of all the folks that are, were affected by this corruption, it seemed to me that Ben and Clarissa Baker paid the very highest price. Ben and Clarissa are a couple who met in 1990 in night school on the south side of Chicago. He grew up in the Ida B. Wells homes, and she grew up about a half a mile away. She came from a middle-class family. Her father was a private detective. And they became a couple, and they had three boys. And she ultimately moves into the Ida B. Wells. They really trace their troubles with Sergeant Watts back to 2004, the sergeant asking him for money, and he refused. Ultimately, at the end of 2005, they're driving down the street together into the Ida B. Wells, into the parking lot by their building, and a police officer comes up behind them and another beside them, and here is Sergeant Watts and one of his officers, demanding their keys, demanding that they get out of the car and searching the whole car. They see Sergeant Watts put his hand inside the door, and as they remember, he pulls out his hand and he says, I got it. Clarissa tells me that she saw something come out of his sleeve. And fast forward several months, Ben now has two pending drug cases. He goes on trial in Chicago and ultimately is convicted despite testifying in his own defense, despite his lawyer telling the whole story about the bribes and the corruption going on in Ida B. Wells, and he's sentenced ultimately to 14 years in prison. And it rips the family apart. From what Clarissa has told me, it sounds like it was so deeply traumatic what happened. And here she is, a single mom with three kids to raise, uh, by herself, because she had been convicted in this case with Ben, she's now a convicted felon, which of course means it's much harder to find a decent paying job. You can't get Section 8, which is a federal rental subsidy. So life just becomes infinitely harder. How was Officer Watts finally exposed? In 2012, uh, when Ben Baker was in prison and had been in prison for some six years. One night, he's on the cell block, it's nighttime, folks are getting ready to go to sleep, and somebody telling him, turn the TV on, turn the TV on. He turns it on, and there's Sergeant Watts sprinting down the street on the news with one of his officers. As it turns out, Sergeant Watts has been arrested. This is in early 2012. He and one of his officers were arrested for what was called theft of government funds. So even after Sergeant Watts went to prison, he was sentenced to 22 months, Ben Baker was still in prison. You know, in 2015, at the same time that there was a lawyer, Joshua Tepfer, at the 
exoneration project in Chicago, putting together a petition trying to get Ben Baker out of prison. Folks were protesting in the streets, the murder of Laquan McDonald by a Chicago police officer. The videotape had never been released, so it was only through the efforts of folks in Chicago pushing very hard to get a judge to order the release of that tape that it was out. And once folks saw the, the way this teenager had died at the hands of a police shooting, they took to the streets. 16 shots! 16 shots! And that rage and frustration really changed the tone, I think, of the conversation around criminal justice and helped bring in a new state's attorney, a woman named Kim Fox, who ultimately is the person who made the decision about the mass exoneration. You know, we've been talking in the media for many years now about wrongful convictions and DNA exonerations. It's only recently that we've been begun to talk about mass exonerations, which would be a group of people being exonerated altogether. It's happened in Philadelphia, it's happened in Massachusetts, which has recently had an exoneration of some 20,000 people after it was shown that a chemist in the police lab was really faking lab results and they had to sort of wipe away all of those convictions. I think what was striking to me about this story is the length of time the corruption went on and the fact that so many people didn't stop it. So many different agencies, whether it's the FBI, Internal Affairs of the Police Department. What Clarissa said it to me, and everybody knew, but nobody did anything. I mean, I think as a society, we have to be asking ourselves, who do we believe? And I think that's a very, very important aspect of this story.